I'd like to talk to you about our ideas about an institutional perspective of how to um, rescue, discover, uh, capture, and archive scholarly orphans. Uh, so let me start by saying this is, of course, not just me uh, um, coming up with these sort of ideas. Right? This is a, a teamwork effort, and, uh, and you may recognize a number of those names on that list. Uh, it's the team at Los Alamos and also collaborators from Old Dominion University. Uh, some of the folks have moved on to different posts by now, uh, but this is basically the core group um, involved in this sort of an effort. right? So what is the, uh, the background? What's the, the problem and the topic that we're trying to address? right? Uh, this will not be a surprise to you, of course, that you know, researchers across disciplines throughout the research life cycle, increasingly so, use productivity portals on the web uh, to uh, advance their research, right? So we use Figshare, for example, to share our data sets, let's say. We use SlideShare for our slide deck. Uh, we use various platforms based on Git to uh, share uh, source code, let's say. Uh, we do uh, online peer review um, uh, platforms. We use those for just uh, a few minutes ago. We heard about those efforts. And of course, there are other platforms that we use for uh, blogging, for example, right? And so the reason why we use those platforms readily and happily is that they come with very appealing characteristics, right? So, for example, they're making it easier to share our research output, like SlideShare, for example. Uh, we get, you know, versioning sort of systems out of this. We get timestamping. We get DOIs so we can cite uh, potentially, ideally, reliably our research outputs, right? So all these sort of characteristics make this really appealing for us to use these sort of platforms, and we happily do so. So two examples really quick uh, of, of uh, researchers that I have um, randomly picked. Uh, Emma over here, she has an orchid, so she's a really good citizen in the scholarly uh, universe. And uh, as you can see with the, uh, by the URIs um, uh, pasted here below her picture, she has an account on GitHub, so she uses that. She uses SlideShare, FigShare. Uh, she shares her peer reviews on Publons, and she also has a personal web page, right? Not an um, uh, extreme example. Um, this is uh, just, just one researcher. And if you don't believe me, I have another Another example, Daniel, who was actually mentioned yesterday in a workshop as well, uh, he has an, um, a personal web page as well. He's very active on GitHub. He actually contributes to Wikipedia uh, as well, and also his peer reviews on Publons and so on and so forth, right? My point being, uh, those are researchers like you and me uh, um, that use these platforms on a daily basis throughout the research lifecycle across disciplines, right? This is not a one-off uh, sort of example. So basically, three aspects that are relevant to this context is that a, the researchers' institutions are usually in the dark about these sort of efforts, right? Lanel, my employer, does not know about the slide deck that I'm showing you here right now, right? Uh, but they should, right? Uh, since they don't know about it, they also don't have a copy about it, uh, of it, right? So uh, my, my slide deck, basically, is not in any way de deposited at my institution. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad sort of a scenario. B, the second... Uh, um, uh, aspect of this um, scenario is that um, these these platforms usually there's a, a notion of uncertainty regarding long-term access and accessibility of our uh, scholarly artifacts in those platforms, right? Um, because if you distinguish, let's say, between commercial entities and non-for-profit entities, all of these entities have issues, right? What if your business model changes? Uh, what if you know GitHub gets taken over by Microsoft all of a sudden? And does that change my attitude towards these platforms? Does that change the their longevity? sort of a model, who knows, right? And even for non-for-profits, what if your uh, next funding round uh, dries up, right? If your membership uh, uh, doesn't return the sort of uh, funding levels that you're used to, what then, right? So these sort of questions are really uh, relevant and, and absolutely uh, at the forefront of our thinking when it comes to sustainability of these online uh, portals. And thirdly, C, these sort of scholarly artifacts that we happily share on these um, uh, platforms are um, not systematically archived by the current web archiving infrastructure, right? There is no such framework like Locks and uh, Portico around to take care of these sort of artifacts like we've, uh, we're used to for you know, our PDF papers, right? The other part of that argument also is that researchers don't necessarily use the argument of uh, long-term availability and uh, the, uh, the preservation uh, um, promise, basically, of these portals as an argument to use them, right? Rather, I use Figshare because I get a DOI in return. That's, that's appealing to me. I don't necessarily look at the, let's say, the terms of service in order to make an assessment of how long will this portal be around. 
And uh, I think Jefferson mentioned it earlier that um, uh, from our experience, you know, there are a lot of institutional repositories that are maybe not empty, but certainly underutilized. So uh, mandates or not, I don't think we can necessarily expect researchers to, uh, to actively submit these uh, artifacts to institutional uh, repositories or uh, systems like that. So from our experience, and I'll provide both an anecdotal and uh, some more research-based evidence for this, is that the current web ar archiving infrastructure at best incidentally, maybe even accidentally, archives those artifacts, right? There is no systematic effort to do so. So two examples to support this point. Uh, coming back to Emma, uh, just uh, looked up a uh, SlideShare presentation that she shared on SlideShare. Uh, you see that on the screenshot uh, in the screenshot on your left. And on the right, I used um, uh, our um, uh, uh, Memento time travel uh, service, which basically is a federated search across more than two dozen uh, web archives around the world. And the result set is empty, right? So I don't find an archived copy of Emma's uh, slide deck anywhere in any publicly available web archive. So that's a bad sort of a, a, a situation. There are zero mementos, which is what we, uh, the term we use to refer to archival snapshots available for Emma's uh, slideshare presentation. And I look at Daniel's uh, example, and um, uh, she, he shared a, uh, a data set, or I think in this case it was a PDF document in uh, Figshare. Uh, I used that URL to uh, ask our time travel service again, is, are there archival copies of that uh, scholarly artifact available? And uh, I get exactly one from in this case, the Internet Archive. So a little bit better of an example, but it's only one copy, right? Uh, it's still not a good sort of scenario. So these are the anecdotal examples and another example based on uh, more research. It's an effort we've done a number of years ago where we looked at uh, the uh, entire corpus in this case, or actually a sampled corpus from, from Elsevier pub of published articles. And we looked at which sort of uh, web, uh, web resources are referenced, are cited to from within these, uh, these scholarly articles. And what is their archive? status and the grim picture there was three out of four of uh, uh, web resources referenced from within scholarly articles are not archived right so they are definitely at loss or at risk basically to be lo lost so that's basically the reason why we refer to uh, scholarly articles uh, scholarly artifacts rather as uh, scholarly orphans because again there's no systematic effort to uh, to archive those so that's really where our scholarly orphans uh, project comes in and uh, we're trying to address the question how do how can we you know more faithfully uh, capture scholarly orphans for long-term archiving and uh, uh, we're very thankful for the Sloan Foundation to support this effort and it's important to note that within this uh, effort we're assuming an institution driven paradigm why do we do this well for several reasons a academic institutions typically have a fairly long uh, um, uh, shelf life, right? That's not a new idea, that won't, won't surprise you, right? Other efforts take advantage of the very same sort of a notion, uh, like LOCKS and, and perma -CC as a notion of oh, their academic institutions are pretty solid. On top of that, we argue that ac academic institutions actually should be interested in uh, uh, creating archival copies of their scholars' output. At the end of the day, it's their intellectual property, right? so there should be an interest in there. And of course, it also aligns nicely, in theory anyways, with um, uh, you know, mission statements basically of academic libraries and national libraries as well, right? If you're, <clears throat> I remember when I wrote my dissertation thesis, I had to submit, I don't know, six, seven copies or whatever to my library. So we have this sort of uh, uh, workflow in place, right? But not necessarily for these scholarly artifacts that we're talking about here. The other really appealing uh, um, uh, notion of uh, an institutional paradigm is that this is a bit more of a manageable scale. So this is not the approach that, for example, the Internet Archive takes of trying to get everything by everyone, but rather uh, I've, I've tried to grab the, uh, the scholarly artifacts that my researchers at my institution are producing. Right? So one example to uh, to support these points, right? The University of Edinburgh, I looked it up on Wikipedia, on the English language Wikipedia page, is more than 430 years old. I'm not willing to bet money on the fact that you know SlideShare is around for that long, right? So that's one of the uh, aspects. And in terms of manageable scale, uh, the university has a bit more than 4,000 researchers and uh, 36,000 students. Let's say it's 40,000 people, right? 40,000 people. How many scholarly uh, productivity portals or productivity portals can you come up with? I don't know, 20, 30, 50, that is still a manageable scale, right? This is still much better than trying to get everything by everyone from all over the place, right? All right, so what we came up with, what we're proposing basically is an institutional pipeline that consists of three components and it's all controlled by one brain. So this is how it works. <laughs> 
on a regular basis, uh, the orchestrator uh, who knows, as a component, knows about an institution's researchers and it knows about uh, where these researchers are active. So what sort of productivity portals the researchers are using. On a regular basis, this orchestrator would trigger uh, what we call the tracker. And the tracker pings these productivity portals and asks them, do you have something new, any newly created artifacts by the researchers that I know? In case the tracker uh, uh, recognizes there's something new at these individual portals, it sends a message back to the orchestrator and says, yeah, I found something new, and here are the URLs of these new artifacts. That's the second step then. The orchestrator would uh, process this information and create a new message, send it to uh, the second component, which we call the capture component. That's the component that goes out and actually makes an archival copy of the discovered scholarly artifacts. Right? And I'm happy to talk more about the technical details there, but I'm skipping it here for the sake of uh, time. Once the capture process has completed the making an archival copy of uh, um, scholarly artifacts process, it sends a message back to the orchestrator and says, yeah, I'm done. And I created uh, what we call VARC files as an archival record uh, for web resources. And then as a third step, the, um, the, the orchestrator would send a message to the archival component that says, uh, my archival records are ready. Uh, you can get them and ingest them into uh, an, a web archive. Right? So a fairly simple sort of a pipeline that can be implemented. And we, in fact, did. We implemented it uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, yeah, in a realm of a pilot project. And we divided up the components in a way that it made sense to us, in a way that the tracker and the capturer and also the orchestrator, they are run by us, by like an institution, let's say, right, from an institutional perspective. The archival component, the, basically the replay of your archived snapshots, that could be done across archives, right? Uh, I'm sorry, across institutions. There's no reason why, you know, LANL needs their own web archive, publicly accessible web archive. This could be a resource shared by uh, many institutions across, you know, an organizational unit, across a country, let's say, or even continent or what have you, right? So our pilot, uh, available at myresearch.institute, we were able to trick 16 uh, scholars into signing up for this, um, uh, for this pilot. Um, uh, some of them are actually here at the conference, and uh, they all have an ORCID, so they're all regal citizens, right? They all have identities in various different scholarly, um, not necessarily scholarly, but productivity portals around the, the web, and, uh, and they create uh, scholarly artifacts um, on, these, on these portals. So... This, uh, that's an uh, um, um, overview of the uh, scholarly portals or the productivity portals that we're uh, using within our pilot here. And we actually started tracking uh, scholarly artifacts in August of uh, last year. So for what, 14 months now, we've been tracking these um, uh, scholars, these researchers, and their activity at these portals. And we've um, discovered, captured, and archived more than uh, 17,600 scholarly artifacts by now, right? So that's a, that's a very solid number for all of these 16 researchers. So I invite you to, to, to check it out at my research institute. Uh, just really briefly, in order to you know, make somewhat sense of this in a standardized manner, we use the uh, schema.org typology to describe the artifacts so that we know that you know, a presentation digital document is a slight uh, shared presentation, and uh, we're always talking about the same things, basically. And uh, while I don't have time or I won't, don't want to take the time to do a live demo, um, again, at my research at Institute, you can uh, look at it yourself. This is the interface that you'll see, which is basically a calendar view of all the discovered, uh, um, uh, tracked, discovered, uh, captured and archived scholarly artifacts in uh, um, uh, uh, chronological order. And what happens if you click on one of those uh, artifacts and one of those uh, icons there, you basically get a splash page about the, um, the scholarly artifact, right? Give you some more information of who did that, where is it created, what sort of an action is that, what sort of an artifact is it. Uh, you get some more metadata about it. You actually see the, uh, the messages that were back, sent back and forth between the uh, individual components of the pipeline, right? And of course, you get a link to the web archive where you can replay, we can actually access the, uh, the archived object, which is uh, displayed here. And you probably will not be able to see that, but this is actually hosted at um, uh, scholarlyorphans.org, right? So a different domain, um, basically showcasing the case that this, should, this could be uh, cross-institutional. This does not have to be dependent on institution A or B, right? So aside from the... Uh, from the notion of you know we're doing the right thing in terms of archiving uh, scholarly artifacts, there are other side effects to this sort of an effort, which are I think intriguing. One of which is we can run statistics on that, 
right? So more on the technical side, uh, from an institutional point of view, uh, we've, we can come up with statistics such as how many artifacts have we uh, 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 captured and archived. Well, I mentioned that all more than 16,000, uh, 17,600. The uh, in, in terms of what this what this takes, right, for computing resources, it's actually not that bad. And again, we've run this for uh, 14 months now. Uh, the event database that holds all the information of uh, my researchers and their portals, it's really not that big. Of course, you know, the VOC files, the actual archival record, that, that grows. And uh, you know, uh, anyone that is involved in web archiving uh, can tell you that this is, this is normal, right? Uh, the index is fairly manageable, right? So this is to say the scalability of the thing is actually uh, um, uh, a, a really... Uh, um, at a manageable size, let's say, right? Other statistics that are really intriguing from the institutional perspective, right? For example, is, well, what are the portals that my researchers are active at, right? What's the distribution? And we'll see in our case, uh, the distribution is absolutely dominated by, by GitHub. So most of our um, uh, tracked uh, artifacts are actually coming from, from, from GitHub. Uh, personal websites play a role in there as well. We had some, uh, quite a number of Wikipedia contributions, a little bit of Figshare and SlideShare and those sort of things. But that's an interesting fact. I, I, I know <laughs> that LAML does not have an overview of these sort of things, right? So that's an interesting and appealing sort of a factor. Of course, we can come up with other ideas, right? Uh, what is the distribution of the, uh, uh, the contributions by, by researchers? And of course, that's anonymized. Uh, but that's a distribution that you kind of expect, right? You have researchers that contribute more, and then you have researchers that contribute less, and some are more or less average, even though it's, uh, uh, the deviation is pretty high, right? Uh, if this is your measure of success, then it means that I'm a really bad researcher because I'm down there, but that's beside the point. Um, other metrics that you can come up with in terms of if you want to know you know how how busy will my pipeline be right just a, a, a simple ekg sort of a graph of the number of artifacts that we're tracking on a, a daily basis uh, that's also a frequency that you would kind of expect and you see the gap uh, right around uh, the holidays right around christmas no one is doing anything during that period of time that is expected but you know we, we'd never go, get much beyond 100 artifacts per day Right, so if you scale that up to the size of your institution, again, this is only 16 and only 12 platforms, right? Uh, 16 scholars and 12 platforms. If you scale this up to the size of your institution, it is still a, at a manageable size. It's still much, much better than trying to get everything by everyone from all over the place, right? So lastly, uh, another um, approach that we tried was basically just uh, um, uh, plotting out the frequency of the tracked or discovered artifacts by portal, trying to see whether there's a correlation, right? Do people do maybe more stuff on uh, GitHub first and then create slides that they share on SlideShare and then maybe write a review about it or something like that? We didn't find any patterns like that, but it is interesting in a way, and I'm not sure whether the contrast is st stark enough that you can see that, but it is interesting in a way that um, uh, you can, for example, ask the question, what the hell happened to Stack Overflow? Right. Early on in you know uh, August of 2018, there was quite some activity, and there is nothing ever since. So I don't know whether that means that no one is using Stack Overflow anymore, at least not you know amongst our researchers. But maybe this sort of trend analysis is something that you could take away from from here. It also seems to be the case that um, reviews and uh, uh, slides are shared you know in bulk mostly because they're really clustered. It's not an uh, um, um, not a, not a not a normal distribution it seems which kind of makes sense i upload you know three or four slides at the time those sort of things slide decks at the time uh maybe that's an that's an indicator of how your researchers actually work right all right so to to summarize this thing two more slides one is basically the notion of uh, what have we done here well we've tried to showcase the scenario that from an institutional perspective we can run a system like this right we can uh uh, we know our researchers, we can try to figure out where they're active, and we can run a pipeline that helps us um, discover uh, their scholarly artifacts on the web to capture them and to archive them. Uh, those artifacts are out of scope for efforts, systematic efforts like that we're used to, like clocks and portico, hence we definitely need an effort like this from our point of view. And the institution seems to be well positioned to do this sort of thing, right? It's in their interest, they're usually around for a long time, so that should be uh, a good starting point. And of course, our, our prototype is surely not optimized for you know, performance and those sort of things, but it does give you an idea of how this can be done. And uh, it, it does give you also an idea of what sort of capture technology could be used for, for an effort like this. 
So lastly, I want to uh, show a slide with a couple of uh, uh, snippets because especially in Europe, we often get this question, so how about privacy and those sort of things? A uh, very valid point. And so before we started the pilot, we contacted all 16 of our um, researchers and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. Are you okay with that? And uh, the, the feedback was uh, positive throughout the board. Everyone said, this is really cool. Please go ahead, do it. Um, the, 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 the first uh, scholar actually said, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see whether I behave the same from now on, knowing that you guys are capturing my scholarly output, right? which is interesting. Uh, another one said, this is public anyways, so please go ahead and do it. This is really cool. And, and do you know about the other guys over there that do something similar? Um, I'm cool with it, right? So no one says that researchers aren't cool anymore. Uh, the last comment was really intriguing to me, right? Because we basically got two emails from this researcher, and this researcher in the first email said, this is really interesting, uh, happy to participate. And a few minutes later, I received another email from the very same researcher said, oh, and by the way, could you please uh, send me a copy of all the stuff that you captured from me? Because I lost track, right? So another idea that even even the scholars themselves, right? Uh, I, I, and I, I'm probably in the same boat there. I don't know anymore where, what I have contributed to all these, uh, these platforms, right? You lose track. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop here and open up for, for uh, discussions. Thanks a lot for listening. Hi there. Uh, great presentation. Very cool project. Um, one of my main questions is around the sort of tracking of statistics of the artifact, mm -hmm. because I know, for example, I'm a developer. My Git workflow is that I commit thousands of times, you know, in one project. I know others who do, you know, one big commit. And then in terms of slide share, maybe you're going to have, you know, one big slide deck that you right. finish at the end of a long project. So I fear, fear that that will be very skewed towards certain platforms. And I wondered if you had a way to sort of address the distribution by maybe commit size or some other method. I know that gets complex, but yeah. yeah. So that, that's a really good point. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, part of the reason why we see two thirds of our artifacts coming from GitHub is exactly the fact that you mentioned that, you know, that's how people use Git platforms, right? For one. For two, our frequency of uh, pinging the um, uh, GitHub, pinging the GitHub API is higher than it is for SlideShare, let's say. Uh, there's various policy and technical reasons for that. So Publons, for example, gives you a quota on the API, right? You can, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, uh, and, and thirdly, we're tracking several different types of artifacts on GitHub. So, you know, your commits and your likes and your, uh, your issues and those sort of things, right? Whereas for SlideShare, there's really on, only one uh, artifact uh, type and also only one event, right? You upload something, that's it. Uh, so for that, uh, uh, it's 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 natural that we'll see the dominance by uh, from from GitHub. The way it can be addressed, so one of the things that you mentioned, I think I, I would uh, not disagree that is the notion of the threshold, basically from from a size on or something like that. The the problem there is that you don't want to lose anything, ideally, right? But it's still it's still a pull, so we're still trying to ping the the API, right? It's it's there's a chance potentially that we're losing something depending on what the API can can provide. Um, you can throttle the API queries, right? You only query once a day rather than once an hour or something like that. So those are some hybrids, I guess, that you can uh, try to, but would be interesting to find out what, what the golden uh, uh, medium there is, right? And I, I don't, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Yeah, it'd be interesting to equalize all that and see what the cost of that would be. On oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. On the overall platform. yeah, but that's also where the institutional perspective comes in nicely, right? Because that depends on your uh, archival priorities, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah. Thank you. Very cool tool. Uh, I would like to have it, but I'd, um, just a very dark perspective on it. Uh, how comes if uh, an institution is going to use this kind of measurements in order to measure the performance of researchers that have to, you know the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I can actually get darker than that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right, my, my employer, in theory, forces me to uh, uh, submit everything I publish through a review and release process, making sure that nothing classified has been published. Uh, and if we ran an, a thing like that uh, from, from a Lanolin point of view, and I'm, I'm actually working on it, it could be used to, you know, basically punish your scholars for not going through the review and release process because you actually discover things that, you know, should, should have gone through this process. So there, there's that notion as well. Uh, and that, that plays a little bit, you know, towards the, 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 the privacy concerns, right? And there's several different ways of approaching this. So, for example, you, 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 uh, no one forces you to make this, from an institutional perspective, uh, an open archive. Right? It could be a dark archive, could not be accessible from the outside world. Uh, 
you could ask your, your scholars beforehand, are you okay with that? Uh, which sort of uh, portals would you like us uh, to, to track? Right? Because we also don't necessarily distinguish between um, scholarly or not scholarly contributions, right? Uh, that's why we don't have like Twitter or YouTube in this in this list, right? Because if I upload a dog video, it's probably not scholarly. If a vet does it, it might be, right? So we punted the ball on that one completely. Um, so yeah, you can opt in, opt out, sort of several different scenarios that you can envision in that one. But again, there's where the institutional perspective comes in handy because it's a manageable size. Right? I can ask my 4,100 scholars, what do you want me to do? There's another one right here. Oh, sorry. This one back there. Yeah, I think we're ignoring this side of the room. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. It's like a tennis match. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Uh, how do you foresee uh, folks who use an alternate email address or alternate identifier for some of the research because it works better in the platform? Mm -hmm. And also, how are you working with sort of collaborative projects? A lot of things like on GitHub are there because of Collaboration. Yeah, two very good points. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if um, so, a lot of where the the functionality of the system like this, as as of right now, is completely dependent on what the APIs of these portals uh, give us, basically, right? Um, we have our, our event database basically has a mapping table between uh, uh, Scholar's Orchid and the individual IDs on these platforms. This really shouldn't be that way, but as of now, I can't think of an API that lets us query by Orchid, right? So they all have their own universe, they all have their own identifiers, so you need to, to match that. Uh, um, and it's entirely possible that we can uh, query APIs for several different usernames of the same Orchid, uh, that, that map to the same Orchid, so that would be fine. Uh, Collaboration is basically the same sort of thing. Uh, the API gives us uh, um, uh, artifacts based on a, on a user identity, whether that's a research group or one individual that's part of a group. You know, that's, that's basically uh, beyond what we can do right now, but it would be an interesting uh, exploration of how this affects maybe statistics as well. Totally. Thank you, Martin. All right, thank you. Okay.